AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast, the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Another day and no shortage of news. I hope you guys had a wonderful uh, Independence Day, however far back that may have been when you're listening to this, but I got to tell you, a lot of people were talking to me about the fact that this is the the most positive, the most excited Independence Day of their lives. They've never felt more optimistic about the country and its leadership, and uh, I think that is a majority opinion. Um, I, I, I think as more of us, us being conservatives, become uh, unafraid to speak up, it becomes more obvious that we are actually the majority, and we are. We'll find out that we are in a nation of 300 million people, I promise you. We're the majority. We will continue to be the majority. Now you add in the movement, the walk away movement. If you haven't heard of that one yet, Google hashtag walk away, uh, which is is gaining steam, rightfully so, uh, as liberal progressive Democrats begin to look at the party they support and wonder who the hell they are and what the hell they are. Anyway, great show today. We got James Dellingpole lined up. We got uh, author Patrick K. O'Donnell, the author of uh, Washington's Immortals, The Unknowns, and a bunch of other. He's a combat journalist who has uh, actually been embedded, so he does know what he's talking about. But uh, as usual, we open up the show, kind of catching you up or keeping you up to speed on what's going on. This uh, this immigration thing, this border thing, is still at the center of the uh, the left's rage, uh, even though they continue to lie and embellish in hyperbole to the to, to the max, I guess is how uh, an 80s person would put it. I want you to listen to this. This is a, another testament to the, the crumbling education system in this country. This is a professor, Professor Michael Eric Dyson. I want you to listen to him talking about the borders and what's going on at the borders and what it means and what, what, what apparently the Trump administration is trying to do. Listen up. How do you compromise with somebody who uses such draconian measures? The, 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 the ability of this administration to, um, in one sense, deny the legitimacy of human life to, to make sure in their own calculations of public policy or ge gestures in public that they will use children's bodies as the kind of capital to procure a democratic investment or at least cooperation is extraordinary. Is It is not only draconian, uh, some, since we're speaking theologically, would suggest it's even evil. A denial of the legitimate aspect of recognizing the other. Even in combat, uh, people say that we must recognize civilians versus those who are combatants. So now we are taking innocent children, yes, children who through no fault of their own are caught in a situation to be punished by a president and a justice department that has failed neglected and refused to see that there's one thing to talk about public policy, another thing to make children innocent suffer for that value. Now, well, as to whether or not the Democrats will, will negotiate uh, is still another story. They've evinced some capacity uh, to do so, but this doesn't solve the ultimate problem of what we do with people meeting at the borders and how we treat them and how we turn them back. Don't be fooled. Many, 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 and I'm not sure if it's a majority or not, but I know it's a lot of these kids are not being separated from their parents. They're being separated by somebody who bought them, uh, who paid to have them accompany them to the border so they could come across. Because as the law states, you are allowed to come across, catch and release. Uh, well, it did state under the Obama administration. Draconian and evil, 
that's what the Nazis did. And you notice the, the continuation of them trying to to put Nazi hood, Nazism on the right when it's actually a, a foundational element of the left and socialism and fascism and all things that go with that. But the embellishment, the, the fear mongering, how are these kids being punished? They're being given three meals a day. They're living a lot better in any facility at the border than they were in their homes. Uh, that much I can assure you. When you if you've been to South America, you understand it. It truly is, in every sense of the word, third world. Yeah, even Mexico. This guy is a professor, so he's he's molding and shaping young minds. And you often hear people say those who fail to acknowledge history are doomed to repeat it. And yet we have liberals and progressives who are pushing and 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 actually eager to revert back to those days of segregation of isolation by based on race uh and if you don't believe me first of all the students of michigan who petitioned to have a blacks only dorm or the students at harvard who petitioned to have a minorities only graduation this is michael dyson again michael eric dyson listen to him talk about college and and uh, a quote-unquote holistic approach to college admissions and and tell me what jumps out at you as as far as uh, uh, progression and progressive and and making advances in racial relations listen to this look already it was illegal to have a quota that is to say we're going to make up for the numbers of black and brown people who have been historically denied or compensation to make up for the historically maligned African-American and Latino populations. But what it does suggest is that there should be a consideration of race and a holistic understanding of how uh, college administration, uh, uh, college admissions are administered. So in that case, race is a figure, a significant feature among many others when considering a, a person. So that diversity enhances not only African-American and Latino people who have been denied access, but those white students who need to have the benefit of uh, those black students and brown students. For instance, think about the fact we would have far fewer people inclined to call the police on strange acting black or brown people if they actually had a college course with them and interacted with them. But secondly, what's interesting here, we're not talking about the, uh, the, the masses of uh, colleges and universities here. We're speaking about the intense competition for the elite, the top echelon, so that 15 percent of college uh, age students are black, and yet they are only 6 percent at these elite institutions. Mm. Uh, like Latinos, 22% of the population, and only 13% at these elite colleges. Well, mainly it's because they come from democratically uh, run into the ground cities and education systems. But the fact of the matter is he is pushing for race to be a factor in decision making. And I keep trying to explain to anyone on the left that will listen, why is race a factor in any decision you make and about anything? That's where I think the confusion lies with the younger generation. The Red Hen restaurant example, when Sarah Huckabee Sanders was booted out, apparently there's a large contingent of LGBTQ people in, uh, that work for the Red Hen, and they wanted her booted because they didn't agree with her and didn't like uh, what she stood for. But they're the same people that are out there uh, marching in protest because they're being treated differently for the things that they do and the things that they believe in. And, you know, the more they speak, the more you realize they are the very things that they despise. They're all, they're all about segregation as long as it puts down white people. Uh, the hatred of white people is just, it's, it's, it's gotten insane. And the hatred of capitalism is, is on the rise, too. And you're listening, well, you saw it in the New York primaries where a full-blown, openly admitted socialist who wants to disband ICE was a winner in a Democratic primary, defeating the fourth most ranking Democrat in, in D.C. And you're seeing people all around the country. There was a great exchange of tweets the other day. Sarah Silverman, who's a complete buffoon, was making commentary about socialism she responded to a tweet and a comment that dan bongino had made and dan had said basically the only people that are for socialism are people that a don't know what it is or b are trying to win an election and she responded sarah silverman called him daft and basically told him you know socialism is this and she just began to describe something that isn't even remotely related to socialism they they really believe socialism is a world where everybody has equal opportunity no one's born into uh their circumstances the the, the society uh elevates or or uh, uh decapitates those that are outside the medium and that's not what socialism is socialism is all about the government running and controlling everything from a 
prediction perspective. But Tommy Laren was on Fox News the other night, and uh, she was talking about uh, the rise in socialism. Why don't you listen to what she had to say? As an American, it terrifies me that self-professed socialists are winning primary elections and that we've got the DNC chair cheering that on. As an American, that does terrify me because I know what it means to be a socialist nation, and that's not what we should ever become. But as a Republican, as a Trump supporter, I'm happy that the Democrats are finally being transparent. They want open borders. They want to abolish ICE. They want to abolish the rule of law. This is what the Democrats want for this country. So as a Trump supporter and a conservative, I think it's going to make the midterms easier for us because I think the American people are smarter than that. And also, I'd like to remind the young people, because there's been poll after poll that has stated that young people are becoming more comfortable with socialism. And they're becoming more comfortable with socialism because they don't know what socialism is. They hear people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders talk about socialism and how it's about equality and free things. But that quickly descends into a black market mm -hmm. for toilet paper, right. as seen in Venezuela. So I would encourage all young people who believe that they are socialists or democratic socialists to take a lesson and find out what it actually is before they're rooting for yeah. it. Educate yourself, guys. Educate yourself. Socialism is not what you think it is. Socialism has never in the history of mankind ever worked to the benefit of people, to the benefit of humans. And, and by the way, just so you know, Socialists and socialism are all about socialism for everybody else, as long as it doesn't apply to them. And you look at these European countries, these socialist European countries, they are government-watched and run from cradle to the grave. They are subsidized by the government. They are manipulated and, and controlled by the government. It, it's just it's ridiculous. It's challenging when you continue to have to debate people who aren't informed on the debate topic. Who don't understand the topic you're they're debating something that isn't real against an argument that we're making uh, uh trying to define and make them understand again just look down at venezuela do you want to live like that i mean i don't think uh, america would get there but that's what socialism is and how it works and how i mean listen you think those i guess you call it the peasants in russia are excited about socialism when everything they do is run and controlled by the government anyway I just thought that that's fascinating that more people, and it's more people than I thought, uh, don't understand actually what socialism is. Switching gears, you've heard that the president is going to be sitting down with Vladimir Putin in the coming weeks. But I want to I want to switch back to something that was at the forefront of the media's attention until it started to look like President Trump was once again going to succeed and make things awesome, uh, which was the North Korea situation. I want you to listen to John Bolton his discussion around the dismantling of the North Korean nuclear arsenal. We're uh, very well aware of North Korea's patterns of behavior over decades of negotiating with the United States. Uh, we know exactly what the risks are of them using negotiations to drag out uh, the length of time they have to continue their nuclear, chemical, biological weapons programs and ballistic missiles. Uh, the president would like to see these discussions move uh, promptly to get a resolution. This has been the advice that China's leader Xi Jinping has given us as well. Uh, so we're going to try and proceed to implement what the two leaders agreed to in Singapore. Uh, but rather than have a, uh, a, a series of reports, things are going better, things are not going well, they're concealing this, they're not concealing that. Uh, really, it doesn't serve the purpose of advancing the negotiations. But there's not uh, any any starry-eyed uh, uh, feeling among the group doing this that uh, we're well, well, well aware of what the North Koreans have done in the past. How quickly will North Korea turn over its actual arsenal? I mean, are they using diplomacy as a cover? Well, it's uh, certainly that's what they've done before. But uh, Kim Jong-un was uh, very emphatic several times in Singapore. He was different from prior regimes. Uh, now we'll let their actions uh, speak for themselves. And we you have... were emphatic that you were different here as an administration, that the weapons are going to be handed over before concessions are made when you were with us last time. Right. And we have developed a program. I'm sure that uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo will be discussing this with the North Koreans in the near future about uh, really how to dismantle all of their WMD and ballistic missile programs in a year. If they have the strategic decision already made to do that, and they're cooperative, we can move very quickly. And it's to North Korea's advantage to see these programs dismantled uh, very quickly because then uh, the elimination of sanctions, uh, aid by South Korea and Japan and others, uh, can all begin to flow. Trump's going to win again. 
and we're going to have peace in the Korean Peninsula and an ally, maybe another ally, in the end of the Korean War and a billion other things to go with that. But that's not big news. The big news now is that uh, Obama-era photos of the border are continuing to elicit anger and vitriol from the left. Take a short break. On the other side of this break, uh, Breitbart's James Dellingpole is going to join me. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Jeannie in Pennsylvania. I think he's gotten away from what we really hired him to do, which is draining the swamp. If you look at the real picture of draining a swamp, you go in and you take all the water out. What sure. does it leave? It leaves the gunk. He cannot mm. get rid of the gunk. We have to get rid of the gunk. Everything he's doing, he's lowering the water so we can see who needs to go. The only way they can go is if we vote them out. Breitbart News Daily. Weekday. At 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now, as he does each Thursday, is the host of his own podcast, Delling Poll. He is uh, a man who has helped me uh, become incredibly informed about the uh, the largest hoax in the history of mankind, which is, uh, I'm not sure what it is this week, but it has been acid rain, climate change, global warming, and ice age in my lifetime. Uh, I'm sure it's going to get another name at some point. And, hey, James, first of all, good morning. Good morning. I want to ask you a question since you're over in Europe. I would assume that the world should be ending any time now since we pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord and that was going to end the Earth as we know it, right? Yeah, it's, it's happening already. I mean, huge fissures are opening up in the Earth, and we're getting <laughs> two-headed, two-headed sheep. And, um, yeah, I mean, the four horsemen of the apocalypse is all happening here. We joke about it, and it is something to joke about because the, the fact that they've foisted this, this hoax for almost a century is criminal in the very least. One of the things that I was turned on to by the book you, you pointed me to, Green Tyranny, was – the suffering going on in Germany. Germany is, is full steam ahead on trying to go green. People don't understand that when, no matter how green you go, if you're depending on the sun and the wind, you have to have a full-blown backup power grid to support that, that, that green energy when it doesn't work, when it isn't mm. working. You're not going to be getting rid of coal-fueled plants and coal-fired plants, um, but you're going to be adding to them with, you know, I, and I'm not. A, I don't care about the fact that wind turbines make the the countryside look brutal or whatever. I, you know, people, the environmentalists that get all caught up over that. But I, I guess what I'm wondering is, over in Europe, the green movement is seen as as I mean, it's an ideology far bigger and far more uh, embol- entrenched in the mentality day in and day out than it is over here. But what lessons have you in your in, in your years? What what lessons have you learned from the green energy? farce that we we should already know over here and we're not we're not paying attention to well you know one thing i would disagree with you on is i think it really does matter actually uh, that, that wind turbines are ruining the countryside i think i think you know we need our green spaces and even though most right. of us live in the big cities now we need to get out and and, and look at, at landscapes as god intended them to, to look not not have our, our countryside turned into industrial zones, which is what's happening. Right. I mean, one of the many great things about President Trump is he really, really hates wind turbines. I think, I think if you had to, in 50 years' time, when we look back on this era, I think that, and, and we're making lists of the worst things that ha- have happened to our age, I reckon top 10 definitely would be wind energy. And, it, I mean, if you could add solar energy to that, then I think you'd, you'd probably definitely be top five. They, these, are, these are evils. They're not just kind of um, examples of, of you know, a, a slightly bad idea that could be better. We are talking ideas that are morally wrong, which are causing people economic damage, which are causing yeah. damage to their health. There's a new report out in Germany just this week, which, which confirms something that I've been researching for a long time and, and have, have long suspected. So I've spoken to victims that the low frequency noise produced by wind turbines is damaging to people's health. 
some people, not everyone gets affected, but, but if, if you are susceptible to that kind of thing, then it, it makes you sick. Now, here you've got a form of energy which is being imposed on people uh, against their will often. I mean, you know, often communities have these wind turbines uh, built near them, and the, it, by the time they realize how dangerous these things are, it's too late. It's a done deal, because what happens is that these wind turbine operators are very canny. They move in swiftly. They get this kind of apparent grassroots support. They bribe the local communities. It happens in Britain. It happens in Germany, where, where, which you mentioned. It's happening in the USA. It's happening in Canada. And I think that, that the Trump administration is the turning point of this global renewable energy disaster. Clean energy is evil energy. Yeah. The challenge That's a good with that story, argument, isn't it, by the way, Kurt, clean energy is evil energy. I, mean, I, I don't think anyone's used it. Before, I like that. I think they should. Yes, I like that. But the challenge, though, is that that the the counter argument to the low frequency noise that they create is offset by the the pollution that coal creates, and people that live close to power lines are said to have higher incidence of cancer uh, as well. I mean, there there's it, well, no, it's, you, know, Kurt, you can't look. You can, everything has to be subjected to a cost-benefit analysis. So, for example, right. you look at the car. Cars kill right. loads and loads of people every year. Are we going to ban the car? No, because obviously its uses vastly exceed its, 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 its problems. But when you look at wind turbines, they don't, blow, they don't work when, it's not, when, when, when the wind's not blowing. They don't work when the wind is too strong. They... They require constant backup from fossil fuel energy because they are unreliable, intermittent. They destabilize the grid. In every single respect, wind power is dodgy. Dodgy is a nine-bob note, as we say over here. And so, so, so you know, if they do, the human health impact is not in any way mitigated by the argument that somehow coal is worse. I'm not buying that argument. You're sounding like a dingless greenie today, Kurt. I like to, to make sure that no matter what side of a topic I'm taking, you know, because when you get over here right now in this country, and I'm sure probably over there as well, people are, if you say something, you represent everything. And so I want people to understand, I, I you know, I, I understand energy and how it works. I understand the reason uh, green energy isn't a legitimate option is you can't, res you can't store it. The fact of the matter is you well, use it yeah, when it's that, there or you don't uh, use it uh, at uh, all. And also, of course, there's the awkward fact that there's no need for green energy anyway. I mean, the, the, right. the, the, the entire argument, the entire argument for, for clean energy rests on the heroic assumption that man-made carbon dioxide is warming the planet at a dangerous and unprecedented level. If, if that is not the case, then there is no point whatsoever for renewable energy. You remember, like, five years ago, the Greens used to have another argument, their kind of backup. In fact, it was their early argument. We had to get rid of fossil fuels. We had to, sorry, we had to wean ourselves off our addiction to fossil fuels because peak oil. Do you remember that, that excuse? That excuse was, yep. was prevalent for a long time. Now we know, thanks to... Thanks to unconventional oil and gas, thanks to, thanks to fracking, we know that, that peak oil is not a thing. It, you know, it, they can't use that argument anymore. So all they have left is the ocean acidification, which is absolute rubbish, and the man right. is warming the planet, which is, again, we know is absolute rubbish. So there is no justification whatsoever for solar energy, for wind energy. It is an absolute scam, and frankly, everyone involved in those industries should be locked up in prison. I'm with you. I like the thought of solar energy as an alternative for, for people in a, in a unique situation, but it's being presented to us as life-saving and our only option, of which it's neither. But the other piece is, and I asked you this last week, in the debate with climate change uh, zealots, what can they point to factually to defend even one argument about whether it be Ice Age, uh, global warming, whatever, whatever term they're using this week, I don't know of anything that they can scientifically put on the table that validates or, or backs their argument in any capacity. No, that's right. That's why they are so rude to us and why they are so reluctant to debate us and why they use all the battery of 
the armory of rhetorical fallacies against us, the appeal to authority. In other words, scientists say dot, 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 like the scientists are these keepers of right. truth and you can't, you know, there's nothing you can do to gainsay them. Um, there's the ad hominem, of course, you know, James Dellingpole is just a dumb a dumb right. uh, arts major, so what does he know? But Bill but Nye, the science guy, is brilliant. They have any actual arguments. They back up their claim that you're dumb by quoting Bill Nye. You know, I mean, it's it's a joke. It, it's... It's like everything else. It's it's if you want to well, know what they're I, actually you know, doing. I don't like saying the, the the Bill Nye is is just a kind of is a not qualified game because that means that nobody can just do a bit of reading and, and form their own conclusions. And I think the Well, but you're not James everyone... Dellingpole the science guy. Hold on a second. That's a difference though. He calls himself the science guy as if He's representative of a scientific community. He's not representing the scientific a, a community. a very good point there, Kurt. It's, it, and, and that is actually emblematic of the techniques they use, isn't it? It's kind of smoke and mirrors. It's, it's, you know what it really is? It's propaganda. I mean, Goebbels, right. Dr. Goebbels, would have been right. Hitler's chief propagandist, would have been brilliant in the, in the Green Movement. He's, he'd have their yep. measure exactly. He'd know how to, how to play the game. Because that's what they do. Yep. It's propaganda. I'm, I'm with you. I, the people that they represent or that they use to represent and espouse their, their viewpoints, nine times out of ten, there's no expertise. I, I was just playing a segment from a, uh, from a professor, uh, uh, Professor Dyson over here, who was talking about the need to go back to including race as a factor in college admissions. And, and, and it's, it, the, more, the, the more they speak, the more you realize how retro they are. They, they're, we have colleges over here where student bodies are asking for bl- – black students are asking for black-only dormitories, black-only graduations. And I keep ex- trying to figure uh, – didn't we – like, didn't Martin Luther King march to get rid of all that stuff? And now we're asking <laughs> for it back? It's yeah. just insanity. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and I say that because I watch over there, and the Tommy Robinson thing, I don't know what the latest is on him. Over here, I watch General Flynn's get his life and career ruined because the establishment didn't like him. And this year, in the last 24 months, I've seen, and I could be wrong, but I've seen more incidents of power from a government perspective destroying people's lives for the simple fact that the people in power didn't like the person they were destroying. I think the Obama regime was so corrupt. I think I think it was like a tin pot dictatorship. I think yeah. the, the the way that the the DOJ was abused under Eric I mean Eric Holder is a crook. He's I mean yeah. it's a joke the, guy, the, the 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 idea that he was in charge of a justice department. My god. Uh, I mean and don't get me started on crooked Hillary. I I just think in in Trump's second term uh, and that's a given, by the way. In Trump's second term, I really hope that, yeah. that all the that they lift up the rock finally, and all the cockroaches are, are finally squashed and brought to account. And that would include pretty much everyone in the Obama administration. The abuse of power being exposed by this scandal at the FBI and DOJ. Uh, it's, hopefully isn't it is extraordinary? I mean, it's way worse it's than Watergate. Terrifying. If yeah. this, well, can you imagine not, if, if, if this were if this were Republicans who'd done this? I mean, how much how much leeway do you think they get in the media? Can you imagine the New York Times? I mean, <laughs> that's why I kept getting pissed about people saying double standard and hypocrisy. Those words are too weak to describe what we're talking about. We're talking about treason. We're talking about people who are who have absolutely put themselves and their party's interests ahead of the nation uh, and the people that voted them in. That's 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 treason. You were that's, you were one not... an election away from America becoming a, a kind of liberal fascist tyranny. Can't even really fathom were. that, James. Can't even think about what the world would look like if Hillary Clinton had won. It's one of the few consolations that, that, that we have over here. I mean, people like me, I mean, I don't mean generally, because Trump gets a really bad press over here. I mean, I was at a party yeah. last night, a, a party for Britain's leading conservative magazine, The Spectator, and all the kind of the government were there, and, you know, all the cabinet and stuff. And even, even in, the, in conservative circles, those of us who worship the god Trump we were in a minority, and we were sort of going around and sort of exchanging our secret handshakes and saying, isn't he wonderful? Isn't... But Trump really, is, for some of us, is the only consolation we have in Europe yeah. that the world is not ending.
Well, and I'm going to want to talk to you about it next week because I'm reading more and more about this whole Brexit thing and wondering when the hell oh, it's that's so going to break. Man. I tell you, you, you if, if you want a depressing show, we'll talk about Brexit. James, Brexit always Trump. a pleasure, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, all right. See you, buddy. Bye. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with A.W.R. Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or a firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash A.W.R. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. I'm joined now by, as I have been in the past, by author Patrick K. O'Donnelly's written The Unknowns, Dog Company, uh, Washington's Immortals, We Were One. Uh, you can find them all on Amazon.com. He's got his own little niche on Amazon.com. He's, he's that good. He's been embedded uh, he's been over there. He's been in, in the thick of things and, and been able to see it firsthand. Good morning, Patrick. How are you, buddy? Doing well, Kurt. How are you? I'm good. You know what? I was thinking yesterday, Pat, as I, as I you know, I, I enjoyed the holiday and, and very grateful that my country still makes the amazing kind of people it does from uh, 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 the people that serve this nation. And I was wondering, you know, I, I saw a story about the first ever July 4th holiday, the 1777, when they celebrated, and there was a, a somebody posted a, a newspaper article from then and and i was wondering i was thinking about you know the the amount of pride in the country at that time had to be just through the roof and you know what they had done uh, i don't know if they ever fully grasped the scope of what they had done but i look at it in 242 years later i wonder what happened i i've got a country full of of liberals who are professing their hatred for this nation uh and apologizing to people around the world who our our soldiers have gone around fought and defended and I'm wondering, is there a specific point in the past? I think it was the Vietnam War, but but I'm wondering if there's a specific point where being anti-American became a thing living here. For me, it's hard to comment on that, but I will tell you this. But during the American Revolution, we were in a civil war. We were a divided right. country then, too. And the, that, the, that being the loyalist Americans that, that sided with the crown. And this is a constant um, issue throughout the entire revolution. I mean, 1776 was a really rough year for the most part. The, right. you know, the, it starts out fairly well with the, um, you know, the, Boston, the, the British leaving Boston. But in the summer of 1776, this is the start of the Battle of Brooklyn, the Battle of New York. Right. This was a real disaster for Washington. And, you know, my book, Washington's Immortals, covered the American Thermopylae. Where you know a small band of Marylanders literally saves the United the, the United States, which is newly born from July Fourth, and allows Washington's army to escape across the East River um, through an epic stand. Uh, you know, but this is this this is a series of defeats um, in in New York City, for instance. There was one bright spot, the Battle of Harlem, but there's Fort Washington, where over 2,700 Americans were captured. It was one defeat after another, and, you know, Washington is at the end of his rope in many ways. Politically, things are going horrendous. The The colonies are not happy at all uh, because of the, the string of defeats, and he decides to make an epic counterattack at Trenton to, to turn the tide of the war. And that is where, um, at the end of 1776, things are... It's a miraculous turnaround. They take out the, the right. post at Trenton, and uh, there's a, a victory later at the Second Battle of Trenton, and and then also at the Battle of Princeton. These series of three victories change the course of the revolution, but it doesn't last that long because there's there's defeats after that, even in '77, um, and the it, it later as the as the war progresses things get worse in some ways and there's hyperinflation i mean like think about the weimar republic this is horrendous then people were were in serious trouble take a wheelbarrow full of uh you know printed money uh and the british were very clever too they they actually had captured printing presses in philadelphia as, as well as stock, our paper and we're printing our own um continental <laughs> to devalue it really and they were yeah. waging economic warfare on it 
Um, and this was causing some serious divisions within the country. And in, in you know, 1780, that's another very interesting year because the British are stalemated up north. They decide to go south in 79. Um, and first in Savannah, it doesn't work out that well. But then they go to South Carolina and they take out Charleston. There's another massive haul of, of American prisoners and sailors. They see the the city, and then there's a massive defeat at Camden, and this is where the entire Southern Army under Gates is destroyed practically, with the exception of the Marylanders, which held part of the line, and it was a sort of a repeat of, uh, in some ways, of the Battle of Brooklyn, where they make a stand, allows portions of the army to escape, but they have to go through these marshes and everything else to avoid Bannister Tarleton's troops. But there's a real wave in the country in, seven, in, in 1780 uh, about, you know, whether or not we're going to make it. And it's right. interesting, too, because you look at Syria, it's similar because the great powers of the world, Russia, for instance, and um, in France and Britain, were talking about forcing our surrender, you know, cutting off the money, right. which was critical. French money was very critical at this point. And then there were also loyalists that were even, you know, that were gaining strength, and even some patriots that were starting to, to wonder. So, I mean, we've, we've faced some very tough times, um, and I think that's one of the things and, that we can look back upon is that history. I want to touch on something you mentioned, and it speaks directly to your, your, your book, Washington's Immortals. I think at times like this, it's very uh, pertinent and relevant to understand the, the actual human being involved in the in, in, in what's happening. Can you kind of give the listeners a, like a, a summary? What was what was a typical Washington and more the group that he surrounded himself? Who was that typical person? Yeah, okay. There's different types of, of, of soldiers in the American Revolution. There's the militia, which were locals typically that would come and go, and then there were Continental soldiers. And the enlistments here were at the beginning about a year. And then it would stretch to three to five years. And these are the real iron soldiers of the revolution. These are the men that would fought and die for the cause. And they were the, the backbone of the army. And the Marylanders were Continentals. They were, they were these troops that were there for the duration. And this is an incredible story. These are Americans that didn't get paid in most cases. I mean, you know, we look at the volunteer army today. That's, that's wonderful. But these guys never got paid for the most part. They were poorly fed. They were completely under-equipped. And, you know, I mean, the, the stories of Washington's immortals, they walked and marched. You know, I, I looked at the diary entries. There was one gentleman that um, actually kept his diary every day, and he talked about how many miles he marched. They, were, they marched 4,500 miles in two years. I mean, can you imagine that? And most of that was done barefoot because the, the shoe leather – uh, or their boots would wear out in the in the. Oh, and by um, the way, in the, the in Carolina. between their marches, in between their marches, they were in Mortal Combat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I mean, they didn't have tents. I mean, they'd sleep out in the in the rain. Uh, many of these right. guys, their clothing was rags if they were lucky. Their cartridge boxes would literally skin the tops of their shoulders, so they would take moss from the ground and put it underneath the the belt to prevent it from rubbing against the skin. You know, many of these guys were literally naked. And, and there's, there's quite an interesting dynamic that takes place in, in 1781, even in 1782 after Yorktown, where what's interesting is you've got people that literally cross the line um, and change allegiances. And I get into that right. quite, uh, you know, vividly in Washington's Immortals, where Green at one point in 1781 at the battle after the Battle of Utah Springs talks about how there was an interesting phenomenon. Many of his men had left and joined the British, and some of, and many of the British soldiers were fighting with him. I mean, there's this mixed allegiance, and you've yeah. got people that are literally traitors that betray the cause. They give away battle plans. Um, you know, it's a it's a really rough time, um, but the core of the army are these iron men that have uh, their privates, their NCOs, the sergeants, the corporals, and then there's the officers that have iron will that keep the whole thing together. And it's, they're incredible. Yeah. 
at the end of the day, it's it's the belief in the man they were following, right? I mean, Washington el- the, the elicited that sort of a commitment, not just to himself, but to a bigger cause. And, and Absolutely, you know, the, uh, Kurt. I mean, this is leadership, real leadership. Right. I mean, t- uh, somebody that's willing to put his self-interest aside for the greater self-interest of the nation. And um, he's also exhibits incredible battleship leadership. Uh, you know, this is the 18th century where a, a general literally could was out on the front lines in many cases. That was the case with, with Washington. And he literally changes the course of several battles, like at Princeton, for instance, rides out into the fray. It's incredible. Bullets, uh, musket balls, you know, sail past him, you know, within the hair. It's amazing that he was able to survive. Yeah. And it's his and personal I, I, leadership that's important. It's the other thing that's important here is the principles that these the founders imbued upon um, th- their personal leadership extended to the battlefield on how they right. conducted themselves. The revolution was an incredible idea. It was a world changing idea that changed everything. There is so much wisdom in the founders, and it, it's an incredible generation. I mean, but they, they I, yeah. create the greatest revolution in the world in history. I got to tell you, like I said, we, we were talking about the other day. I try to wrap my head around being there at that event, at that time. How on earth did they find the will and the courage to stand up to the strongest? This was, again, these were just common men and women. They were they were survivors. They were they were living off of a new land. There was threats all around them to begin with. They had. They had a British contingent to oversee uh, everything, and they they said, you know, enough, and and that they did that, and they I, again to think about what George Washington had to possess as a human, both from a, a, a an integrity and a charisma perspective, is mind boggling to me. But uh, the the book Washington's Immortals and the author's Patrick K. O'Donnell uh, describes these people, and the term citizen soldier came. This is where it began. Uh, because it, it, in I don't think in any uh, up until the Second World War there was no better example of the citizen soldier than of those first groups of incredibly brave and uh, dedicated, committed men and women. And you know I, I wonder that first year after we know the British pulled out. When I, I, it's a, it's a it's a longer topic for another time, but but at some point. Uh, uh, the two countries had to speak again, and I, I I always wondered why Great Britain didn't follow up. I mean, when they when we won the Civil War, I mean they could have if they had wanted to committed their entire military and 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 probably made a different outcome. At what point did they decide that it wasn't worth the fight, and why? A, a variety of factors. I mean, the the the, the reality is uh, multiple factors. It cost them an enormous amount of money to to fight in North America. The other thing is that, you know, most people don't realize the revolution was multidimensional. It's not only a civil war where we're fighting at loyalist Americans. It's a it's a regular con- conflict, but it's also the a, a global war. The after the French are involved in 1778, the war becomes global. Britain is trying to defend not only North America and its colonies there and take them back, but they also have to to deal with all their far flung their far flung empire, they're they're dealing with India, for instance. They're dealing with the the Caribbean, and they have to somehow defend all of these places, and they're stretched very thin. Um, right. The global war really wears on them, and and what and what happens is after major um, military defeats. I mean, we have this isn't a situation. I mean, I just it try it kind of burns me up about this political solution stuff. Political solutions right. are typically driven by military actions. And in you had a major military and, disaster and vice versa. in Yorktown. Right. And vice versa. And it, yeah. The the di- disaster and epic defeat at Yorktown where an entire um British army under Cornwallis was was basically taken out of play is a huge you know a huge factor um within the revolution. They just didn't have enough troops in many cases. Uh, to deal with all the stuff that was going on around the empire and the defeat there, it compels them. You know, they're they're basically bottled up after that in New York, for instance, and then in Charleston, and a few other places here and there. 
but they're not able to really expand their reach. They just don't have the troops. They realize that, you know, they're going to be fighting America forever. It, if they're lucky, you know, I mean, and, and they're being they're being forced out uh, of these places. So they, well, they, you and, know, they, they agree to a peace. I ask you that question because it's it's translated in many ways to the modern day fight uh, between the left and the right in the sense that our cause never has never changed. You look at the Patriots in 1776. Our our cause has always been about this document and about the the things that it founded and the country that was founded under this document. And uh, you know we're we're in a day and age when you're starting to see very outspoken left wing progressive liberals talk about socialism and the hatred of this country. Uh, but I argue it's why, it, in the sense, I always look at we're going to win in the end no matter what because. We don't have to be paid to protest. We don't have to be paid to fight for the things that we believe. We don't have to be paid to fight for our Second Amendment. Uh, we are okay fighting for ourselves, with ourselves, and with our friends because we recognize the things that we have are, and the things that we've gotten from these men from a, from a sacrifice perspective are, are worth our commitment and, and, and loyalty to for as long as we're alive because those are the things that make this country the country so unlike any other country in the world. This is the most unique and amazing country. It's you know that we that's, the world has ever seen. I mean, it's about freedom. It's about the founders. It's about the documents. It's about the idea that they they fostered. And you know, conserving that idea. That's what conservatism is about. Is about conserving the ideals and principles of the founders. It's about freedom. It's about liberty. It, these are well, you know amazing I, principles that you know no other country has and it's 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 crucial that we uh right. you know look back at the wisdom of the founders i i do want to close out by saying thank you patrick because uh the work that you've done is as someone who's a, a, a voracious reader keeping those stories alive is probably one of the most important things we can do and people like you who have, have put yourself in harm's way to tell the stories that have to be told that these the people in this country have to know and have to learn and have to have to see happening is something I think you've done an exceptional job at and it's, it's greatly appreciated. Look forward to catching up again, pal. My pleasure, Kurt. I mean, it's it's about the the Revolutionary War generation was the greatest generation, but every generation after that was a great generation as well. Yep. I mean that you can say that for the World War One Doughboy generation. I wrote the book The Unknowns. And then the, the Battle of Fallujah generation that I was with, I mean, also a great yep. generation. Yeah. America uh, has a lot I to be proud you. of. Well, no, yeah, no, and I appreciate you bringing those stories home. So God bless you, buddy. You take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Patrick K. O'Donnell. Uh, the book's Washington's Immortals, and he's also written the la his last one, The Unknowns, uh, about the, the men that brought home the remains that lie in the tomb of the unknown soldier. Winners and losers. The loser today was probably one of the easiest picks I've ever had. If you go to Breitbart.com, above the fold story, you're going to see a video that should disturb you. It is a grown man taking a hat off of a, ch a young man in a Whataburger, uh, a Make America Great Again hat, and taking the young man's drink and throwing it all over him and walking away and talking trash. I mean, it's just indicative of, of what the left is actually composed of. Uh, this guy is a coward of the worst sorts. And this happened in San Antonio, Texas. He is the worst human being that I could see in the last 24 hours. And he was apparently called out, uh, and they found him because the, he was reported. He was fired. Uh, he's got apparently he's somebody who has a record. Uh, he was fired, uh, and hopefully his life will be uh, a miserable one until he figures out that uh, tolerance is, is – you have to act it out if you want to if you want to ex if you want to be someone that expects it and, and the the winner is the the social media side of this very rarely are we allowed to look at social media as impacting this country in a positive way but the fact of the matter is this guy was found because enough people cared to post enough posts in whether it be twitter or facebook to find this guy now you know i don't want a physical act in, in response to this guy i despise bullies and that's exactly what this is this is a guy who bullied a young man because he could. And those are the weakest kind of people in the world. But I want his life to be miserable for a while, to, and hopefully in hopes that it never, ever happens again. Good day today, guys. Thank you again to James Ellingpole, as always. Thank you to Patrick K. O'Donnell, uh, author of Washington's Immortals, The Unknowns, Dog Company, a bunch of other books that I would absolutely recommend 
to you. Tomorrow, New York Times bestselling author, Mark Smith. You guys have a wonderful day. I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Menesor. A lot of people not knowing what action they could or should take to make the difference. What I do is try to turn people on to sites like Breitbart, you know, people who are writing and publishing the truth so that people will get educated. But, you know, you kind of can't blame productive members of society who are kind of confused, perplexed as to what do we do to take this government back. Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125.